Ready for a women forward car dealership? Rudy Luther Toyota empowers their many women on staff in sales, management, and service. Whether you are looking for a new Toyota or pre owned vehicle, Rudy Luther Toyota has something for everyone. Every vehicle comes with a Luther Advantage. 10 cents off fuel and car wash discounts at holiday stations, Luther Advantage warranty, and five day return policy on pre owned vehicles. Located just five minutes west of downtown Minneapolis, off 394 and General Mills Boulevard. And they're also hiring. Want to join the team but don't know where to start? Visit RudyLutherToyota.com today. Hi, everybody. This is Don Mitchell, and welcome to Don of Sports. Today, we are talking hockey, but we're also sprinkling in some of the biggest Vikings news with Kirk Cousins gone. But I will have on the one and only Kevin Gorg from Bally Sports North Wild Coverage, and he has his own podcast right here, Wooden Sticks, right here on Talk North. But we are going into hockey, we're going into football, and we're going into some stories. Stick around. Well, this is going to be a fun day, and I think the big news about Kirk Cousins that just dropped maybe an hour or so ago is only because Kevin Gorg is on this podcast, right? Yeah, this is exciting. I um, <laughs> I got the news as I was driving over to record uh, one of my shows, and I we all kind of thought this was coming, Don, and we all kind of figured it was Atlanta, especially the tone that we saw at the Combine from KOC, but... It's just so real now. And then you see the numbers, and yeah. I cannot blame the Vikings. I'm, I'm certain they put their best foot forward, but those numbers were way bigger than anybody thought. Uh, huge, right? Because everyone's thinking maybe 90 million, you know, here. So you look at that and you're like, four years? For how much money? He's 36. I know. With a redone Achilles. Oh, it's a roll of the dice, man. So, you know, hey, good, good for Atlanta. You know, you brought up the combine, and when Kevin O'Connell was kind of talking, you know, he hinted at tampering a little bit, uh, and then he was talking a little bit more, leaning towards, I'm sure there's going to be other teams that really... Uh, I looked at that when I heard him, and I went, huh, I don't think it's going to be here. Nope. And now the question it's becomes... It's so subtle, but, you know, we pick up on it. We have yeah. to. We're yeah. all so curious as to how this is going. Uh-huh. And no real free agent move at that position. So are they just planning on rolling the dice in the draft? Are they going to trade up? Uh, from where they are at 11 to get one of the top three spots. It's fascinating. Or is Justin Fields going to be someone they consider bringing in? I, I think that it's all in play here. And yeah. What I always think about, too, because I work on the NHL side of things, the NFL is unbelievable. The The news cycle never ends. And I'm here for it. Nope. I'm obsessed with Never an off football. season for me, Kevin. It's amazing, though, Don. <laughs> There's never, ever any time where the NFL is not at least a part of the conversation. And that's exactly how the NFL wants it. Yep. You know, it's been constructed that way. And, and I absolutely agree with you. And, you know, Kirk is no dummy either. Uh, first of all, his agent should go in the Hall of Fame too, okay? <laughs> um, McCartney, you should, be, you should be there. But um, he also said, listen, it's um, not the dollars, but it's what the dollars represent. Oh, brother. Right? He took it from somebody. But... It, and he was kind of saying, I think he was hinting towards there won't be a hometown discount, but there's other things that he was looking for. But then he backtracked and he, you know, he talked about his kids loving his kindergarten and loving the schools. So he goes, you know, I can find another school, <laughs> you know? So when you have that, and like you said, the NFL does not take any time off, but Kirk said, Hey, once March comes, you know, beforehand, he's going to be starting to drop videos. He's going to do stuff. We all know that, but. I think the Vikings need to, and I hope they already do, this is their moment that can change the franchise. This is their moment to have a plan. You know, I, I don't know if getting Justin Fields is the way to go because the Bears have not developed a quarterback since, I don't know, I used to cover them. I, I was there five years in the early 2000s. You know, there's even names like Cade McNown. There's other oh. names like, you know, there's quarterbacks that didn't make it. You don't want to be that. Hey, I think Kevin Warren and the Bears are going to change things and, and the franchise is on the move. But I think for the Vikings, they need to draft a quarterback. They need to do all they can to move up, but they can't sell the farm, obviously. You know, you have to make Justin Jefferson happy. You have to have a guy that knows he's going to throw to JJ and get it done. 
do you get another guy in the throwaway year? I, I think Vikings fans have had it. You can't throw away a year and wait for another pick to get up to speed. You need a top-notch quarterback. I think there's some pressure on Quasi right now because oh, we've seen a yeah. couple of drafts, and outside of Jordan Addison, who's a stud, and ended up being a really good pick. Mm -hmm. But, Don, outside of that guy, the rest have been a lot of busts. And so now you're at a really critical juncture for, for his position because the window here with Jefferson and what they're trying to accomplish going into this season now, you have no quarterback. Right. You have no running back. Yep. And you and have. Saquon Barkley went elsewhere. He went to Philly. So He's, he's gone. I heard you, you, they yeah. were the Vikings were in the mix there too. Mm -hmm. Two pretty important positions to surround your stud tight end, your two stud receivers, and the offense that needs a quarterback and running back to make them worthwhile. This is a huge, huge sequence for this organization. This next month and a half, two months is everything. And on the other side, on the defense side, you might lose Daniel Hunter. Oof. You know, what's Harrison Smith going to do? I mean, you've, you've got so many question marks all over the table. So that's why I think they have to hit a home run with the quarterback situation. And at least get one for get a quarterback of the future, instead of playing. And you're right. I think Boise knows that jobs depend on this decision. And and it's not just one decision. It's it's a domino effect. Just like the dominoes are falling today, there's going to be a domino effect of the decisions they make going forward from here. Quarterback, another running back, defense, all. That. And the other aspect of the pressure that they're under. The Lions are still the Lions. They're one of the, the better teams in the NFC. And now the Packers bring in Josh Jacobs today. They let Aaron Jones go. Josh Jacobs is a stud. They bring him in, and the Bears have all these draft picks, high-end draft picks. Yeah. So this division is getting immensely harder, and it feels, at least just watching from the outside, that at least as we sit here right now and we're, and we're conversing, the Vikings are not even close to the team they were at the start of last year. So the pressure has been ratcheted up. Yeah, a lot. And so, but that that's what makes it fun for us, oh, right? Oh, God, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's like... The town's I, melting down, but yeah, it's great for us. One of the best um, t tweets I saw, or X's, or whatever you call it these days. But I'm still the, Twitter. I still call it the tweets and Twitter. Uh, Dave Berggren, who you see, oh, yeah. Carol Levin used to work at Fox 9, and I'm giving him a little shout out because he's always quick with the funny memes. I mean, he's a comedian too, and he's a funny guy. But he had like all these, Um, it was a video of all these um, elderly people at the, the slot machines just refreshing. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. He goes, this is Vikings fans refreshing the feed, the news feed. And I'm like, that's how I felt. For sure. I got out of my hot yoga class today. I'm listening to K-Fan and I'm, I'm looking at my phone. This is before I even turn my car on. Don't worry, I'm not doing it while I'm driving. I'm like sweating still coming into the car going, okay, oh, what? What? I saw what, what uh, Kirk's agent tweeted, and then as soon as I saw it, I heard it on KFAN. I'm calling my station. I'm like, this is the March Madness that yes. is on the other side. Oh, yeah. it's, it's juicy, and I give the NFL a ton of credit. The way they uh, just, from the combine into this, into the draft, it just continues. I mean, it's, it's always percolating. And I again, I mentioned this. I am a huge football fan. And mm -hmm. right away for me, this is how my mind works, because – Anyone who knows me, and if you don't know me, I you should. I'm, I'm a Bronco fan, way. and that's my team, and they're they're a complete hot mess. And so when when this happens, I've got a lot of friends that are Vikings fans. I don't think about the Vikings. I think about fantasy football. I'm like, well, wait a minute here. Right. <laughs> We've got some great fantasy players in Atlanta that need a quarterback. Pitts, the tight end. You know, the 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 Robinson kid in the backfield is just you know Bijan's a, a stud that's waiting to break out. And uh, Drake London, their receiver, now they've got a quarterback that's going to elevate their skill set. Right away, my mind goes to fantasy, of course. Of course. Well, it's also dollars, too. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah well, oh, dollars. yeah. Got to play for some money. I, I don't do fantasy football. What? I said, if I'm going, because like you already said, it's year round. And that's my job. <laughs> that's a good point. So if anything's going to be fantasy, it's not going to be football. <laughs> okay? I need a break. Yeah, and I someone get goes, it. well, I just do it to be up on it. I'm like, come hurry up on it. I can't do it. <laughs> ah. But I enjoy uh, a lot of my friends do a lot of guys that are in our sports department and and in this business, they still do it. Um, I'm just like, that's more added stress for me to have to do that. So I enjoy watching people stress for me in their fantasy football teams. Let me ask you this. Yes. You're a Vikings insider. Yes. If you had to put your hard earned money on the table right now, and you had to wager on who will be under center 
week number one, and if you don't have the right name, is it going to be, I'll put it this way. Yeah. A veteran that they bring in or a player that they draft? I say a player that they draft. Wow. Um, yes, I think you need a veteran to come in. Maybe that's a backup. That's going to help that someone that's going to be smart. I know everyone's saying JJ, you know, um, McCarthy. I don't know if that's going to be him, but it's got to be one of the top notch players. I, JJ, Hey, I watched him at the uh, combine and he really upped his stock in my mind. I was like, eh. um, so, so yeah, I mean, you're coming off Michigan, you, you know, all so the you think hoopla. it's going to be a drafted player, not. Not somebody like like a, I mentioned Justin Fields. I don't know who else is even that available. That will actually be starting. That's another thing. But I mean, for week the game one. plan, week one, it's a tough call. It is a tough call. But I, I still think the big first domino is what I'm talking about in this plan has to be yeah. drafting a good quarterback. Will they get? Will they be ready under a Kevin O'Connell system Oof. by week one? That's a good question. That's when you need someone with a high IQ. Some of the, I mean, Kirk said it took him two years to get it. So, do, but do they change it like they did Josh Dobbs just for a little bit? If this kid has talent, yeah. I don't, there's so many different ways to go. I don't know. Like, who, who's the veteran backup? I don't think any of the backups that are there now are still going to be here. I don't think so either. Um, you know, and plus they got the new quarterbacks coach. That was another signal. Like, hmm, oh, they're not right. going to keep Kirk Cousins. Oh. That was it for me. So, and he was at the combine. Um, Boy, it changes quick though. Right? Yes. I mean, I vividly remember during that Packer game, uh, the Vikings were having their way with Green Bay on that particular day at Lambeau. And then a lot like we saw with, with Aaron Rodgers on that week one, I think it was Monday night football. Maybe it was Sunday night football. I don't know. But you knew right away that it was serious. Yes. Like, when they don't get up right away and they're not like writhing in pain, they know it's something interior and it's bad. And you knew it with cousins right away. What we didn't know, Don, that was the last time we were going to see him in a Vikings uniform. And I got to tell you, you had a relationship, a working one with him. And yeah. Yeah. Just I, like far, I loved person. him. Like I, I Very thought much. he was rock solid on the field. I really grew to love him and some of the, the, the real personality he showed. The last thing we really saw, I think was him taking the shirt off with his kid and the Kirko chains. Yeah. Yeah. At, at the, the Vikings stadium. Came yeah, right to get I it think that up. was spectacular. Yes. So I'm going to miss him. Like I get why they didn't go all in. That's way too much money. And probably, too long a term yeah. for my taste, but I, I love the guy. Yeah, I, I do too. And, and I saw a couple of um, versions of Kirk Cousins as he came in, you know, cause he came in and he was thrown in and, and he was the guy that was weary and wary. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes. You know, like, okay, I've got to learn oh. this quick, you know, all right. Who, who's my offensive coordinator? At least um, Kevin Stefanski, I believe was still here his first year. Um, and he was kind of, I always say you you interviewed Kirk Cousins, but there was always that space between you. It felt that way. You know, there was always like you you couldn't get deeper. I always like to when I do the interviews, right? Okay, you do a, throw, a couple of throwaway questions, and then you just you want them to change, right? You don't want that. I say glossed over. Um, they're very they can be protective. Yes, and that happens with a lot of athletes nowadays because they're thrown into social media, they're thrown into all of that, and and Kirk is a quarterback. You know, and he's coming in with huge dollar signs on him, and he's got a lot of a lot of pressure on him. So I saw that, and then I saw Kirk starting to open up to you know to certain certain people, like the day in and day out, like he would do funny things. Uh, and when Chris Thomason was here, you know, he would always relate to him with his sweatshirts because he Chris would wear something like the 1984 Olympic sweatshirt or something, and <laughs> and it was just enough that Kirk's nerdy side started coming out, like oh, I have a shirt from the blah blah blah, like I don't know. And it'd be maybe the economics team or whatever. So we would see little flashes of it. This past um, few years, once, I don't know what went on with he and, and Mike Zimmer. You know, that's all between them. But I do know a different Kirk Cousins emerged under Kevin O'Connell. And we saw everyone, I think America saw it. Yes. You know, from singing and dancing to the Kirk uh, chains the on the Kirk airplane on yeah. the airplane to to it all he just so. seemed more relaxed right it felt like from afar that zimmer was hard on him which some yeah. courts just have that personality her brooks had that way with his hockey players where he was very hard on him and he was very buttoned up to a guy that you know kevin o'connell came in a little more loosey-goosey younger guy more of a player's coach and that allowed kirk to kind of show some of that personality. The the Coles thing he did, that yeah. was fantastic. The Coles cash. 
Yeah. I, I really I enjoyed watching him compete. I, I really thought he was terrific, but I I completely agree with the Vikings not even yeah, coming business close to and personal that. are totally different. Yeah. You know, um, when I was on crutches all summer and I had to go to training camp and oh. it's 98 degrees and I'm on crutches, uh, the first person to come over and talk to me was Kirk Cousins. No kidding. Yes. To come off the field and be like, what did you do? How are you feeling? Oh. Are you traveling with, are you going to have to go through the airport like this? I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Oh. Um, you know, Daniel Hunter then came over and talked to me about how's the, how's your mental aspect going? Because it's, it's really hard because I couldn't get on a scooter or anything. So I'm like crutches the whole way. Oof. And that's, that gets old, especially 98 degrees, but Kirk came over. And so it was kind of ironic then within a few weeks, now I'm off my crutches and Kirk is on crutches. Huh. Um, and by the way, this is my little humble thing. But if you, if you have your closed caption on, my name is spelled D-O-N, but in the show quarterback during when he's coming off the field I watched. from the Washington and there was Dave, the security. And then I was standing there because they're like, we're going to give you Kirk. And I had a voice like this <laughs> and I wasn't sick. I just lost my voice. Like I took all the COVID tests. I, t- I did not have a fever. I felt great. I just had no voice. <laughs> And Kirk goes, I don't care. I'll still talk to her. And I'm like, I had to do this interview. They probably cut me out of it just because that girl's voice is horrible. <laughs> but when he said, Dawn, we did it, you know, and I'm like, yes, you oh. know, that kind of thing. Um, I'm off camera. I'm not on it. But it's so funny. My friends go, oh, my gosh, just like Starbucks, Netflix has you D-O-N. <laughs> <laughs> All of mine. So that said, he, he's, a, he's a good guy. Julie is fantastic. A wonderful family. Um, and now... They're going to be near her family in Atlanta. So a new chapter begins. Well, probably the final chapter, let's be honest, yeah. at age 36. And, you know, he had to rehab and come all the way back. We saw the video footage. He looks great. You wish him well. I think it's going to be a really good fit. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think Atlanta has an offense that's ready to go. They have a great offensive line, which I think will really benefit him. Uh, so I, I think they automatically become the favorite in that division now. And I think that's a good situation for him. Well, and that's one of those things that he was looking for. It's not just at this time of his career. It's not just about the money, right? But man, did he get money? Oh, did he ever? And how do we get that? I don't know. I should have been a quarterback. You should have. At, Even at a five backup foot quarterback, nothing, man. I should have been a quarterback. <laughs> yeah, sure. Backup quarterback relief pitchers. Yeah. Gosh. Man, we missed our calling. We did. Uh, well, I also want to talk to you. About before we get into the wild, which you're fantastic, by the way, for <laughs> years you. and years and years. I've known you for quite a long time. I know that you're a former goaltender. Nice. Correct. Yes. yes. I've never forgotten that about you. And people at home, I don't even have notes right here. That's, that's no, just in my brain. free flowing here. I'm just free flowing. I don't even have anything. Um, but when we're coming up the high school tournament, mm. it's this year, there's no snow. It feels like spring. People could have done t- 12 other things. We had the bas- the women's basketball tournament in town, but still, it did not disappoint. The tournament remains as magical as ever, and in Lou Nanny's final of 60 consecutive broadcasts, it ends up being, of course, Edina in the championship game on the AA side. And you know what? I- I've been attending the tournament and watching the tournament for five decades. I'm 57 now. I started when I was six years old. It's my favorite weekend of the year. And the hard part for me, this is year 18 covering the wild on the TV side. We're normally out of town for a good chunk of it, but we're always in town for either one of the days early or one of the days late. So I got to go over, be a part of the broadcast on Saturday afternoon, watch the game Saturday night, celebrate Lou Nanny. And it's funny, Don, you mentioned all the stuff going on in the weather, but that, that weekend, if you're involved in the game of hockey is so vital and so important. And I think that, Kids that play hockey all over the state, whether their team is there or not, migrate to St. Paul, come down there, spend the weekend, get hotels, have a great time. It's a big party. And even though it's, I think it's never going to be the same on the broadcast side without Lou, because I don't think you could ever replace a guy like Lou Nanny. The, the weekend event of going and being a part of the tournament remains what it is. It's just so unbelievably cool. And I think that that's what makes Minnesota such a unique place. Indiana has the basketball. Texas has the football, and we have that state tournament. And this weekend was a great reminder that the tournament still is as special as ever. And, you know, I'm from Massachusetts. Oh, you've got some pretty good hockey, too. Right. And we know the whole Massachusetts, Minnesota. But I, hands down, when I first got got here back in 2004, long time. So I think I might be now a Minnesotan. Um, I was told about it, the high school tournament. I go, I don't, I don't know what that is. And they're <laughs> like, what? 
And I was like, well, is it kind of like the bean pot? Bean pot's a great example. Right? And people are like, well, what's the bean pot? So I didn't feel so bad that I didn't know what the high school was. So the first time I went, I'm blown away. All of my friends back home, their sons in Massachusetts, my friend Karen specifically has four sons, play hockey. And they are rabid lovers of the Minnesota State Hockey Tournament. They love it. They're like, we wish we had that here. So it's not all hate between Minnesota and Massachusetts. Just so you know, they love it. And they wanted to fly. They're like, when we get old enough, we want to fly out and be part of that. When I was growing up in the mid 80s, we had an all-star game after the high school season that featured Team Minnesota and Team Massachusetts. So Uh I know that the hockey tradition out there is awesome. And then I've been to college games yes. out there and got to go watch BU and walk around those beautiful campuses, Boston College, where Matt Boldy played. It is a really, if you're a fan of hockey, you need to go to, to Delta Dawn stomping grounds out in Boston and walk around there. There's some unbelievable college hockey out there. You know, it really isn't. Of course, I went to Boston College, so I'm a, I'm a little uh, partial to, to all of that. I'm like, BU as a campus. Joking. <laughs> My friends that go to BU, don't come at me. Put the pitchforks down. BC's campus is better. For sure. Um, but it is great hockey. And then, so for me, um, when I've been going around the country for my career, when I was in Milwaukee, they at least had the Admirals, which was wonderful. Yes. Um, which I loved. And then I went to Chicago. So I was covering the Blackhawks and the Wolves. And the Chicago Wolves won all these. Um, yep. The um, American Hockey Thank League. You. East. Yeah, yeah they, right. Because then it changed because then the I went away and they ate all the stuff. But so I felt like even I was when I was in Illinois and Wisconsin, I still felt hockey was lacking. I did. I was like, where you need more? Where you is have it? more? Like, what's up? What's where's the high school teams? Like, what what's the college? Like, there was hardly anything until you went. And so when I got here, I was like, ha. <laughs> Because I love hockey. My friends that have known me since first, second grade, they know I love hockey. So um, to come here and to be a part of it and, and to just enjoy both state tournaments, the girls and the boys, and to meet the godfather of hockey, yeah, Luhani, the best, who, who I adore, is one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, I was kind of, it was bittersweet for me. It was tough. I felt bad. Like, it was really well handled. I didn't yes. know, Don, how they were going to do it. Because it's still the double-A championship game, and you've got to make sure you respect the event for those kids. Yeah. But they had the ceremony ahead of time. They gave them the beautiful the painting, the picture. And then when I got choked up was during the third period when they played one of his favorite songs, My Way by Frank Sinatra, and he's up there waving at the crowd, and everybody's standing. And he's got tears in his eyes. Man, that got me. That, that, that got me right there, right, right through the heart. Um, but just to go out still on top of his game, like I listened to him all weekend, and, you know, we're broadcasters. Yeah. We can critique each other yeah. like nobody else. He's still got it. Like, he's still he's got still, it. He's so sharp and funny. He's so good at what he does. Oh. And so credit to him to do that for 60 years, to do it at such a high level, and to leave on his terms not very often in this business. And you'd be that good for that long and leave on your terms. And I heard that they played my way. I was not at that game. Oh. I, was, I, had, I had to work back in the studio. I would have been – I'm not much of a crier, but when I cry – like, it's all done. It was probably like the ugly cry. <laughs> I would have been the ugly cry because that was also my dad's favorite song. Oh. And then he used to say for me, you know, because I didn't do the traditional get married right out of college, have kids. You know, I'm like, I'm doing my career thing. Um, he'd always be like, oh, this is your song, too. Like, you do it your way. I'm like, of course. And so that would have had me when I heard after, oh, they played my way. And this, I'm like, oh, I was crying at my seat. I'm like, thank God it wasn't there. It was emotional. And for me, mm. Dark Star was a big part of my journey here yes. into, into broadcasting and, and really a big time mentor for me. And, you know, we lost Dark back in 2012 in June. And at his memorial service, which I was lucky enough to MC out of Canterbury Park, they played his favorite song, which was also Frank Sinatra, My Way. And I think oh. if I look at guys like Dark Star and Lou Nanny, um, the song fits like yeah. they had their own way of doing it. They weren't taking no for an answer. They were tremendous at their craft. And it just, it got me like, I heard that song. I thought of dark, of course. And then I thought of all of us as hockey fans. Like this is, this is the last time we're going to get to hear Lou do a game. And I'm sorry, it's never going to be the same. And I can say that with full confidence, no yeah. disrespect yes. to whoever yes. hops in that chair. It will never be as good and it will never be the same. The tournament will live on and be brilliant like it always is. Right. It, nothing can stop that, that machine that is the state tournament. It is unbelievably cool. But the broadcast, I'm sorry, it will never be the same. And that's 
really a credit to Lou and, and just how good he was for that length of time. Well said. Well said. I, and I don't think anyone that's going to go forward and do it would feel any disrespect. No, you, you, you know, can't. they would be like, that was Lou. <laughs> it's like when Johnny Most left Boston, you know what I mean? Like that's never got, the legends are the legends for a reason. Yep. The other thing I really loved this year that happened before, I mean, he's not going anywhere, but before he stepped down in terms of being the, the, the voice is the fact that he on the wild side got to see Vinny Letary, his grandson playing a wild Jersey. I remember the first time he was brought up when he was um, back and forth bouncing from the minors to and he was with the Rangers and I was texting Lou like, yay. Cause I would just tweet Vinny's like up with the Rangers. And he's like, you know, he's like not here. Right. I'm like, I know, but I, I just think he's a chip off the old block. The kindest kid. Nicest when I covered him with the Gophers. I'm just so happy he's playing. Yeah. And then when he got here with the wild, come on. I mean, perfect story. Louie does four games a year out of 82 and the fact that he's up and he's playing, okay, that's fine. He's playing third or fourth line minutes. So right. you, you know what? And then we're out in Long Island. They're playing the Islanders. Louis in the booth. And and Vinny scores this goal. And His as, first ever, right? First in a wild, a wild sweater. Jersey. Right, right. And he's coming back to the bench, and the players are all yelling Lou. I mean, and Lou's in the booth doing his thing. Like, literally, it's just. but I, I've It's known a Hollywood Louis, script. But that's Lou Nanny's life. Like, I, I'm <laughs> telling you, from knowing him now, for the yeah. better part of a couple decades, that's Lou Nanny. Like, there's just something about Louie. Um, I've spent now three or four years on the road. He comes to these, he only comes to New York and to Florida for various reasons. He's got a bunch of business in both those areas. And they're also great places to go when you're on the road with the Minnesota Wild. So he's no dummy. But Louie just, he has that way about him where things just fall into place for, for Lou. And he's taken us to these incredible restaurants and they're packed and he somehow gets us in. We have the best table in the house. And Louie, you know what? He's from Minnesota via Florida. But even though we're in Manhattan, he's still the godfather there, too. It's yeah. just remarkable. <laughs> well, if you're just tuning in now or if you've been listening for a little bit, let's just do a little reset. I am talking with Kevin Gorg. If you're a Wild fan, you already know his name. He's the great broadcaster for Bally Sports North doing the Wild broadcast. You see him get those interviews in the intermissions as well. Um, former high school and college. Yeah, played Hockey at St. Thomas player. in college, That's played correct. at Burnsville back in the day. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's fun to be with you, Don. So being a goaltender, I have again have now friends that their kids are getting older. It's no longer like just, you know, playing and, and everyone scores. They're maybe in their bantams now and it's hard to be a goalie mom. Um, you put your mother through a lot of stress. You know, my friends like Vanita Sakar saying she's a goalie mom. Oh, stressful. What did you put? What was the worst thing you put your mom through? Oh, I would say. As a goalie. I yeah, know that there's probably a lot. I put her through a lot. Trust me. She worked <laughs> as a uh, volunteer secretary. I went to St. John the Baptist uh, Parochial School in Savage, Minnesota, and she was our secretary. So I put her through a lot. <laughs> probably the worst of the worst would be you brought up Bantams. So you're old enough to know better at that age. I was in the eighth or ninth grade. and. We were in a championship game of our own tournament. Burnsville had this really cool uh, tournament thanks, the weekend after Thanksgiving, and it was all the best teams in the state. And we got clocked in the championship game. And I, after one of the goals I let in, and I got lit up that particular night, I took my glove off, grabbed the puck, and I whipped it down the ice. And, oh, did I get in trouble. Because at that oh, game was Tom Osiki, legendary high school yeah. coach at Burnsville, who also lived in our neighborhood. So I got it once from Tom Osiki in the lobby, and then I really got it from mom and dad in the car. And they were just embarrassed. Like, mm -hmm. I feel bad now thinking back, like, what a dummy. But at the time, I was emotional. I was a kid, and I just lost it. I think we got beat 10 to 4 in that game. And I'm going to tell you right now, it, it probably was no fun for her to watch me give up 10 goals, but it probably didn't matter until I threw that puck down the ice. And that's something I certainly regret. Did it teach you any lesson going forward? Yeah, it did. It it taught me to grow up a little bit and not act like a baby because, you know, Coach Osiki was really good about it. You know, he pulled me aside and just said, you know, you're letting the the other team know they got you. Like, yes. it's bad enough that you're getting beat on the, the scoreboard, but now you're showing them that they've got you. And he was right. And and I was just, at that age, just very emotional. And it was a learning lesson. And, and you know, my parents were, they were strict, but they also would have a conversation and, and they were like, dude, what are you doing? Right. Like, what are you doing? And I, I just, it was a, from that point on, 
especially when I got to the high school level a couple years later, I, I learned to channel my frustration a better way. And it was kind of one of those tipping points, Don. And, and as kids, you always get to those spots where you make that, well, that one error and you're like, oof, I want that back. But you can't get it back. But what you can do is be better the next time. And, and, and you know, it's funny because, you know, Tom Mosiki, as I mentioned, was our high school coach. He lived in our neighborhood. But like Herb Brooks, he kept you under his thumb. Like he was the guy that he wasn't a player's coach necessarily. He was the guy that was going to push you hard. And so it was good because my, myself and the guys that were my teammates in that era, uh, we were a lot of fun, but we needed that guy, that hammer kind of running the show. Otherwise we never would have had the success we did. You know, you bring that up. One of the biggest lessons, my mom and my mom didn't play sports. You know, she loved sports. She talked to the television. Football was her thing, you know, like, well, I run that slam play. That was dumb. You know, that kind of stuff. Very quiet, very proper. She kind of looked like Sophia Loren threw up on Jackie O, that kind of a, Ooh, yeah. like, hey, if you see what she looked like when she was younger, I come out like the blonde version of like, hi, I'm lost. Who do I belong to? <laughs> so she would be on the sidelines and Becky said, call it the pocketbook, but with her purse, like, you know, just standing on the sidelines, watching me play soccer. And what I would do is I would get mad. Like if a girl did a cheap shot, you know, or kick me or if the, if the ref missed anything, I would get so mad right? That they, I, it'd be in my head, like, mm. like, and I wouldn't say anything, but it was in my head. My oh, yeah. mom could see my face, um, that I would make two more mistakes, you know, like then, then someone, I was, you I weren't was thinking about what you're supposed to do. You were thinking about that. And I get beat. And yep. then my goal tender would get beat. Cause the, you know, when I was younger, I was a, the, the starting line de- defender. So I remember my mom sitting down and it's funny too, because I, I respected my mom. I love my mom, but she hadn't played sports. Like where my dad did, if he said something, they're like, oh, I got to do that. So my mom, she's like, you know, driving me home. And she's like, you know, every time you let them get in your head, you let them get the best of you and you make two mistakes. You go, well, mom, like I'm thinking you don't get it. Right. <laughs> and I don't say that because then I get in trouble. I'm like, but mom, it's different. It's different when you're playing. And she's like, no, I know you. I go, what am I supposed to do then? She goes, look at them and laugh. I go, what? She goes, smile or laugh? Yes. And I said, and I'm thinking, that's not going to do anything. Next game, someone did something. Ruff didn't see it. It was egregious. I just laughed at her. And the girl that I laughed at looked at me like, huh? And I got the ball and I brought it upfield and I scored as a defenseman, right? I'm like, wow, my mom is brilliant, right? So it's the same thing. I take it into broadcasting where if I make a mistake, you trip up on a word. If you get mad, you're going to make five more. Yep. Just go with it. Like uh, if I People chip up on a word, you just We're keep human. going. Right. Yeah. People don't want you. They, they don't want to feel awkward watching you. If you make a mistake, you just keep on going. Who cares? But I remember that, like that, those lessons that your parents give you. It's amazing they kind of how they stick carry over, you. right? They, yeah. They do. They carry over into all your life. And I think that's the beauty of sports at, at any level. Uh, and I told my kids, because my, my daughters, I have three of them, they weren't into like sports, mm-hmm. but they got into like competitive cheerleading and one got into lacrosse. I said, I don't care how good you are. I just want you to have the experience there because all of this matters. Like mm-hmm. working together, one common goal, figuring out how to uh, face adversity and overcome obstacles. It's all going to benefit you later in life. And, and I didn't know it then. I know it now. Right. Then how much all those sports mattered. I was good at hockey. I was good at baseball. I tried soccer. I was horrible. And golf, I kind of went up and down. But it was great to, to be a kid at a time trying to figure that stuff out because it's no different than life now. And you learn to kind of, because listen, life can beat you up, right? No matter mm-hmm. what. And our jobs are fun, but there are good days and bad days like anybody else. And all the lessons we learned as kids, they all come back to you. They certainly do. Oh. Don't laugh disrespectfully, but just laugh. Because <laughs> then people don't know what's going on. That's exactly uh. right. So let me ask you this, being a goaltender, and now this year, year you are covering Marc-Andre Fleury. Hmm. Uh, Gus is amazing, too, but it's Flowers' year in it terms is. of, you know, go, going past Patrick Waugh, just everything. And he's just such a fantastic person um, to, to be around that. So you're around legendary goaltender, but he, he doesn't carry himself that way. Not at all. And... He's one of the funniest men I think I've ever talked to and his practical jokes that he tells us about and that he performs are the best. What's that been like for you? Well, I was a fan from afar. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a, I'm a Pittsburgh Penguin fan through Sidney Crosby. So when they won those cups, I was celebrating those Penguin teams. I wild fan first, but I really like in the Eastern conference, the Pittsburgh Penguins. And I loved Mark Andre Fleury because 
he was kind of a throwback in in this new generation of goaltending. The guys are all six foot five and they play this block and slide style and they're very effective, but they're not what I grew up with. I grew up in the seventies and eighties watching goalies play what I played, butterfly style, flopping around, two pad slides, very exciting. Not at the time, I mean we look back now, not as effective, but certainly more entertaining. Well, Marc Andre Fleury is a throwback. He plays that style and he's a superstar. Heck, he's a rock star. Mm. So from afar, I was this big fan. And on trade deadline, we had no idea that was coming. And all of a sudden, we get the update that Mark Andre Fleury is coming to Minnesota, and I lose my mind. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like giddy. Exactly. So they flew down and got him, and it just so happened that that afternoon, when when he made his first appearance at the XL Energy Center, I was walking in to work, and I got to carry his sticks. Billy Garen actually had his bag, and. It was a really cool moment, and we struck up a conversation. I mentioned a long time ago that I was a goalie. I mentioned that I loved watching him play everywhere else, and I didn't know what to expect. But when your heroes are beyond your expectations on the right side, like he is, I'm not kidding. I've done this for almost two decades. I have never covered anybody as nice or remarkable as Mark andre Fleury. So we're all sitting here, and, and I tell my coworkers, like, listen, we're going to be telling our grandkids about this time. Like this era of wild hockey is going to be something we talk about to the day we die. Like it's that special. Like we've never covered a hall of fame player ever. We've covered a hall of fame coach in Jacques Lemaire. We've never had that guy. Now there might be others. Kaprizov might be the next, but this is the first hall of famer I've likely covered on a regular basis. And the conversations, the, the practical jokes, the interviews, the chemistry, you can't fake it. Like it's just, there's something special. I'll give you an example. We're just in Arizona playing the Coyotes last weekend. We get done with the game. He played great. I got to interview him. All kinds of good fun. Same day as the day that Duhame, mm -hmm. one of the guys that's in one of those practical joke wars yes. with him and all the shenanigans, gets moved, moved to yeah. Colorado where we're going for the next day. So we're getting ready to leave Mullet Arena in Arizona. And he's always one of the last guys on the player bus. I'm on the media bus, but I'm watching out the window. And he's having a conversation with the Detroit Red Wings equipment manager because all the Red Wings bags are sitting there waiting to get moved in. They're playing in there the next night. And all of a sudden, they pull three bags off the pile, and he starts fiddling with their skate laces and doing these things. He's is it pulling... Duhames? No, it's not no, Duhames. It's it? the Red Wings. Oh, the Red Wings. Yes, so he's got right. three of their bags, and he's Who done something. It? We don't know which players they were. Oh. So now we go to Colorado, and I mentioned to him that Duhame believes that you're going to behave because he just got traded, and it's been a tough 24 hours. You go, oh, yeah. Yeah, we've got a truce. Everything's cool. So the game goes off. It's a hell of a hockey game. Flower doesn't play. Gustafson plays great. And I'm getting on the airplane after. And as I'm walking by, because we sit in the way back of the plane, the players are in the middle, and he tugs on my sport coat. He goes, do you want to see something? I'm like, sure. So he pulls out his phone, and the equipment manager for the Avalanche, who he had negotiated a deal with, shows me these pictures of what were his dress shoes. And he, had, he went to the store and got these these cartoon mouse covers for these shoes with these big floppy ears. So when Duhame got in the locker room after the game, he's got these floppy mouse shoes waiting for him in his stall. And there's a little <laughs> note from Mark Andre Fleury. That's the guy that he is. Like That's he the is best. the he is the gen, genuine article. Um, every minute I spend with him, I'm smiling, and I hope to God we get one more year. I'm wondering now who in Detroit who did he mess with? Like that, like. Who's his buddy? Like well, that's the stuff he I want knows to know. so many players, right? Like he's played for so long. The Vegas connection, the Chicago connection. Yeah, I'm sure we could sit down and look good. at the roster. And Bottom line is, he took the time to do that. Oh yeah. And I just think that's what makes him just such a an absolute character. And and he's still one. I mean, he's having a terrific year on the edge. He's still a really good goalie he's a great player. But aside from that, just the the person he honestly is, and the influence he has on his teammates. Like this is going to be a ripple effect that's yeah. going to benefit. Uh, the Minnesota Wild, Bill Guerin, this coaching staff for years to come because there are some really impressionable kids in that room. And when one of your players is in there that's a legendary player that works as hard as he does, that is as good a person yeah. as he is, that's going to positively affect your organization for a long, long time. I have an assignment for you. Okay. <clears throat> when I uh, sat down last year one-on-one -on -one with him and I, I asked him, I said, hey, we, all, we know about some of your pranks with, you know, Sid and and everything. What is your best one? And he wouldn't tell me who. So I need to find out who. And I won't broadcast it, but you need to at least report back. His favorite, and you might know it, but he said, well, one of my best pranks is, and I won't say who, but 
we were, and you know, his accent is so cute, right? It is. And he's like, so, you know, I had to get the hotel involved. So he said, you know, sometimes when you get out of the elevator and you're on your floor, there's like a little lobby area. And some of them are small. Some of them are big. This one was big. I said, okay. He goes, we recreated his bedroom <laughs> right there in the, the he Come goes on. like the mini lobby, like the lobby of your floor. I go, what? He goes, oh, everything. He's like, oh yeah. I go like computer. He goes, computer, clothes, bzz, everything. He goes, oh, bed, everything. So <laughs> he goes, so we're going in the elevator. He goes, the door opens whoop, and it's his room. <laughs> and he goes, That's incredible. And I'm like, oh my God. So now I'm like. You're not going to say who he goes. No, I don't the think he's still plank. over it yet. Oh, yeah. He goes, I don't know plank. if he's over it yet. <laughs> I have to find so, out. I'm like, that is, that is the guy. And also the other thing that stood out to me in the interview is I said, you know, your smile is amazing. I go, it's infectious. Like it some is. people don't have infectious smiles. They've got beautiful ones, but like yours is kind, but like, it just makes you smile right back. And I said, when did you know you could use that? <laughs> and he said, you know, when he was with his billet family, right? He said, I didn't really know a lot of English. And he was a teenager. He's away from his family. And he said, you know, his billet mom just said, if you don't know anything in English, just smile. You'll get away with so much. And he goes, <laughs> and I do. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I love this guy. Yeah, so he's he just is. a great, great person. He really is. And and I just, I really, truly believe that, uh, you know, you wonder over the years, you know, we have these great gigs, right? You've mentioned yeah. some of the conversations you had with cousins, some of those Vikings players. I sometimes have to pinch myself. And I go back to my very first year of traveling uh, back when it was Fox Sports North. And I'm on the road for the first time. This was 17, 18 years ago, and I'm on the plane, and I just, I, I, must, I don't read a lot of books. I don't. I watch a lot of movies, but books I don't read much on. But I had a book by one of my childhood heroes, Ken Dryden. Mm -hmm. um, it was called The Game. And I'm, I've been reading this book, and I, the hockey season starts, so I'm going to have that on the airplane. I start to read it. And all the stories from the locker room from those Canadian teams revolve around Jacques Lemaire and Mario Trombley. And I'm looking, and they're like three rows in front of me, and I'm like, this is remarkable. Here I am, right? And I had no idea what I was getting into. Right. I had done broadcasting out at the racetrack at Canterbury. I had done some high school hockey, but it was my first kind of baptism into the NHL. And it hit me at that point just how lucky I was. Like this is, and I feel the same way now circling back uh, nearly two decades later, working with Marc-Andre Fleury. This is going to be a moment in time that I will have special, you know, special yes. to my heart forever. Um, because of the goalie he is, but more importantly, because of the person he is. And it, it's just an, it's a blessing for sure. We're very, very fortunate to have the, the gigs we have. Mm -hmm. And whenever I have a bad day, which we all have bad days, I think back to some of those memories. It's like, oh, this is fine. It'll yes. be good. It'll be good. It'll be good. And um, I'm going to kind of take that and next step into it'll be good. Um, coming off their last game in overtime. Wow. Right. Boldy. All right, all right. I don't know. Boston College. I have to say that every time. Boston College. I put my hands <laughs> up in the air. Boston College, um, who, who's having a phenomenal year himself. He is. But I also want to talk about the aggressive mindset that John uh, Hines had by pulling. Another Massachusetts guy, by uh, the way. Hello. We're, we're all over the place. I know we you are. Billy Guerin. Hello. Right. Yes. Boldy. We're like, we're, we're just everywhere. How about the move, though? I had no idea. The move. The I did move not to pull. know. Because you might lose that point. I didn't know that. I, I, I've yes. been around hockey all my life. I did not know that if you pull the goalie in overtime and the other team scores, you, you lose that point. You don't get that and, overtime point. And right? the other thing I didn't know, because sometimes in this game, we've seen teams try to put a goalie uh, on the bench, get an extra attacker, and then quickly get him back on the ice. If you do that, it's a penalty. Yes. So this was the ultimate roll of the dice. Yes. We need two points, and we're not leaving without them. And then the cute interview with Boldy after the game where he admitted he didn't know. And he's like, well, I guess it's fortunate we scored. And he had a big smile on his face. That to me is, is it was the kind of win. And, and they're in a dire spot. They're still six points out. I'm not going to paint any rosy right. picture here. But they're at a point right now where a win like that can really do something for a, for a hockey team. And the schedule finally lightens up a little bit this week after monster showdowns with some of the best teams in the league for a couple of weeks here. And Nashville's one of, one of the hottest teams, so beating them. But now you get the Arizonas and the Anaheims and even that game at St. Louis next week and doesn't seem as daunting because of the way they won that hockey game. Physical, playoff-style game, hottest team in the league, came in 10-0-1 in their last 11, had just beat you 6-1 the week before. There was something about that game and then the way that John Hines 
threw all his chips on the middle of the table and said, I'm all in here. I think yes. it really helped their psyche. I know when he pulled that, I was like, what? I, was I knew out. that they were going to lose. I, I knew that they could lose the point. And I was like, that's aggressive. That's crazy. I like it. I it love better it pay now. off. I, I know. I go, better pay off. <laughs> and then when it did and it was boldy, I was like, oh my <sighs> gosh, that was just awesome. Like that's what I said. I hope it can kind of move the needle and move it, move it forward. I give them credit. And, and I've been around this thing all year. It's felt like two years. I'm not going to lie to you with the injuries, with the trip to Sweden, with some of the things that have gone on, the coaching change, all the players. And I've had this conversation. I had this conversation with Brodine and Spurgeon before Christmas. It feels like this has been the longest year mm -hmm. to their credit. They will not go away. They will not quit. They will not fold. And if you look at the core of this hockey team from Kaprizov to Eck, to Brodeen, to Felino, these guys have guts done. They have the type of guts and courage. Like they just, they want it so bad. They play through injuries. Eck tried to play on a broken leg last year. Felino, I know is not healthy right now, but he's just working his way through it, dropping the mitts to protect teammates, all the little details that, that just tell me that in a couple years, and I mean this, they are going to be in a really good place. They're going to have that 15 million back off the books that they can spend. Ooh, They're going to have young talent that's rising. The Brock Faber thing this year, the Marco Rossi oh, thing this year. we haven't even talked about Brock. Seriously, this team is set up, and I know Wild fans are sick of hearing this. I understand it. You bang me on Twitter all the time. I get it. Trust me when I say this. They are going to be in such a good place in another year and a half that it's going to be crazy good. And I can't, again, they're still making a push here. They're going to be good. If they're healthy next year, they are a playoff team. But I'm talking cup contender here in a couple of years, and I, I'm here for it. What is the main difference between Dean and John and how the team has responded? I know sometimes you have to fire a coach because you can't fire the players, right? I mean, if you need to do something, that's a drastic move, and Bill Guerin is not above doing that. Right. Um, so, but what have now that things tempered down after that first like initial whoosh, you know, we got a new coach, we better be on our P's and Q's what's maybe the personality difference or the style difference or has, is there not much after that? I don't it's know. It's pretty subtle. I mean, if you watch the way they play, the system isn't really that different. Right. And I think, you know, you look at what Dean did the last couple of years, over a hundred points in both years. It's clear this guy's a great coach. And then the man he is just a tremendous human being. So I'll say it this way. Every coach gets to a point where, they have tried different things. And when teams get into a funk, they're in their own head, right? The Wild were better than they were playing. We all knew it. They were losing close games. That, that game in Detroit that ended up being Dean's last game late November, um, they just looked like a fragile outfit. So Billy Guerin was put in a tough spot where he knew he was losing a really good coach. Dean's got to go somewhere else and do really well. Yeah. I know that. But the time was right. And a, a couple things that John Hines have do has done that have paid dividends. And the first thing is, the way they efficiently break the puck out. He gave them a more specific way of doing it. And a lot of times coaches in this league, especially will trust the skill that they have and they're fine. The while we're getting in their own way, breaking the puck out. And so he had a couple of quick little details in practice those first couple of weeks where he was just tweaking a little bit, but it gave them an efficient way to quickly get it and get it out of the zone. They're a fast skating team. They've got good mobile defensemen. So that worked. The other thing I've seen is just a little more detail on the power play. And I think, specifically putting your very best players in that top unit and maybe overplaying them a little bit has been a good thing for this team. Other than that, they really haven't changed a lot. And I think it was one of those situations where the players had lost all their confidence. Like they were battling, but it just wasn't working. And when you get a change at that position, you kind of, kind of hit the reset button and say, all right, we got to do better. And we will. And they got on a run right away. Ironically, they got banged up after that initial burst where I think they went like nine, two and one had a bunch of injuries again and then struggled, but they have just kept fighting their way through it. And if they get in, it'll be one of the most remarkable recoveries of all time. It's, it's going to be a long shot, but the fact that they're still in it, yeah, they've never really had Jared Spurgeon. They've missed all their key players for stretches of time. And I mentioned Felino, mm -hmm. but that's just one of six or seven players that have been banged up. Johansson, another player they're missing right now. It's pretty amazing. And now I think the last detail in that push came on trade deadline day when they basically moved players for draft picks for 2026. And in that locker room, I can tell you, being out there in Arizona, that they had the players had a distinct edge to them when they got to the rink, particularly that night and then the next night in Colorado where they have kind of said, that's cool, we're still going to get there. And yeah. that can be a good thing, too. Yeah, that is a mindset. Mm -hmm. That's definitely they were like, a we're not giving up. And I think yeah. that's the 
I, I've been doing this for a long time. The character in that room right now with those leaders, it's as good as I've seen. I mean, I look at the way they perform and the way they care and the way they battle, no matter what the circumstances are, uh, they're in a very good spot. With They've got good young players that are leaders, that work hard, that care. And, you know, you look at the course of time and the teams I've covered, there's been some where that's been the case. Others were no. Right. They would have packed it in. And this team refuses to do that. And I think that is really something that no matter what happens here in the next six weeks, I think it'll still be a factor uh, for the years to come because these guys still have a lot of hockey in front of them. You know, uh, just as an aside, that 10 goal game, which I was there as a fan <laughs> and I was there with Vanita. You picked a good game. I picked a good game and I brought my family in um, uh, earlier in the season. Where it was on the, the back-to-back with the Bruins. So they won in overtime in Boston and then they came here. Um, and, and I think I told the story on a previous uh, podcast because it was hilarious because my brother my sister-in-law and my nephew had never been to an NHL game before. Wow. And I have four brothers. So I thought all of them had, but apparently this brother hadn't. Um, and he was, he's not a big fan of like the culture of fighting. Um, so they, you know, they dropped the gloves within the first five minutes. Right. And I'm just looking at him like, Oh, sorry. But I'm like, no, it's Minnesota's different. You know, like this isn't the seventies of the big bat Bruins. Like no, there's no. no fighting in the stands. Like this is going to be a great family outing. Trust me. And so we get there and they drop the gloves in the first few minutes. And <laughs> my nephew, who's telling a story about in school, their a teacher calls it their group of students. They call them the, um, the trailblazers, like trailblazers. Now it's time to go to lunch, you know? So my nephew who's 12 turns to me, um, perfect timing, knowing his dad is a big fan of the, the fighting. He goes, auntie Don, this is where you go. Trailblazers look away, <laughs> look away. And I'm howling, but they won that one. So I was like, yes. So now we've got fa- uh, another generation of fans. Which is awesome. You know, h- half of our family, I wore a uh, Bruin zippy and a wild hat because I did not have to, you know, I didn't. Good combo. Um, yeah, I had to be both. And, you know, I wasn't working, so I could, I could do that. Um, but for the 10 goal game, it was one of those where I knew this year, I, um, in the summer, I had a fractured leg and a torn meniscus. So I was on crutches all summer. It was when I could tell that my knee was healed because I'm sitting down, jumping up, sitting down, it's jumping like a workout. up. I'm like, wow, the wa- all right, my knee is healed. I couldn't keep up. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, <laughs> I, I write down the goals just to have them for my highlight package and then for post game. So I have this placard where I write down each goal, the assist, the time of the goal. I have my own little score sheet and I couldn't keep up. The third period, I literally, I honestly, I've never seen anything like it. They scored seven goals. The Wild scored seven goals in the third period and I could not. I could not update my placard fast. Enough. It was so crazy. It was nothing I've ever witnessed before or experienced. And it was, it was fantastic. I brought up the word placard and it triggered something. So I got it. I I'm very flattered. And this will be the final thing I'll leave you with here. So I, I got pranked by Mark Andre Fleury. Stop it. So here's the deal. We're was- uh, John Hines. Second game was in Nashville. So we're down there. It had to be late November, early December. And I mentioned, I work with placards. A lot of people that do my job have tablets because they're, in 2024, I'm still in the 90s, and I have placards. I write all my stuff down, and I, my interview, all my in-game hits, my highlight package, everything, it's all written down. I've got this huge Sharpie collection, and everybody knows that. So I go down to the mess hall, uh, have my meal, come back. It's like five minutes before I hit the, uh, the bench for my, my pregame interview, and all my placards are gone. And Tony DaCosta, longtime equipment manager. Love Tony. The best, right? Yes. Kind of a prankster himself, yes. right? Yes. So he's... he's doing something uh, with someone's skates over on the workbench and he sees me freaking out and he smirks. He starts to laugh. I'm like, Tony, where's my stuff? And he's like, I didn't touch your stuff. I'm like, Tony, I know you're here. You're, this is your domain. I have my stuff here. Where's my stuff? And he smiles. He goes, I promise you I didn't do it. I said, I'm not asking you if you did it. I want to know where my, my stuff? stuff. I need my <laughs> stuff. So he's like, all right, Gorgie, sometimes all you got to do is look up. So I look up and in the rink where I do my interviews, there's this jumbo size thing that holds all the cords for all the broadcast stuff. And above that, the <laughs> placards are taped with hockey tape at the top of the thing. Well, I can't reach. So Tony goes and gets me a step stool. We're working to get the stuff down and the, I go and get my interview going and everything's fine. What I didn't realize is while all this was going on, our camera guy was warming his camera up in my interview position outside there had the whole thing on videotape. <laughs> So I hope that Flower doesn't come to this podcast because we're going to circle this thing back on him. So during the game, second intermission, the player's coming out to do an interview. He pokes his head out before the, I think it might have been Duhame, ironically, comes out and says, Gorgie, did you find your papers? I heard someone took them. 
So he's playing the, the, the dumb card, right? I'm like, yeah, I got him back. Thankfully, someone did that. I said, Flower, can you believe somebody would take my papers? So here's what we're going to do. And I hope he's not listening. I don't think he is. Maybe he is. Then he'll know. Um, we're of course, sit down. he listens to all my podcasts. <laughs> well, I'm sure he's a regular. <laughs> Mine too. Um, so we're going to have a sit down with him at the end of the year here where we're going to say we're going to talk about something hockey related. Mm-hmm. John Stroh, our longtime producer on Wild Hockey, has the footage of him doing the deed. Stop. And so we're going to say, let's look back at this. And before we get there, I want to say, do you think you could ever let me know which one of your teammates pranked me? Because I know it was one of the players, and I know you'd never do that to a fellow goalie. And he's going to say, no, but I'll find out. Or da, da, da. And then we're going to roll the footage of uh-huh. him taking my placards and taping them at the, uh, the top of the wall there in Nashville outside the locker and room. And then so, that smile will come out. <laughs> yeah, he'll bring that smile out from the Billet family and everything will be all good. Well, so you beat me to it. I was going to ask you like to tell me two quick stories. There's one. Like There's one, like your best hockey moment and like a top hockey moment that you've had, either as, as a player, but mostly as a broadcaster, because that's where you get kind of the behind the scenes kind of stuff. But could even been, be when you interned or you were in college, whichever. Whatever yeah. one you tell around the tables. Oh, uh, let's see. I, I've got so many. I would say for me, probably the, the toughest times would always be when the, when the coach gets fired, like Dean this year. And before that, there's been a handful of coaches that have lost a job because, as you know, in our business, you work so hard to build up that trust yeah. and that respect. And it's a process. And especially when you're a reporter to, to get to that point where you can get the information you need to bring that out in the broadcast. It's, it's gold. Like it's everything to the job. So as recent as this year, when we got word that Dean was fired, it was a really bad day. Like it's a bad day. Yeah. And, and um, you start from scratch and you build it back up. And, you know, John Hines has been great to work with. He's an outstanding person. He's a great coach. So it's, it's building and it's getting there. Hockey wise for me as a player, I, I guess I would go back to, that last night in St. Paul it was the best of times. It was the worst of times because as a kid in Minnesota, you dream about playing in the state tournament. And I played at Burnsville in the mid eighties and I was the goalie on the 1985 team, which was loaded with talent. I was a small piece of that. I played in almost every game, which was cool. And we won the state tournament, which was really cool. But after the game, we're sitting in the locker room and the best of times are we're sitting there and one of my teammates named Herm Finnegan, who I'm going to have breakfast with later this week has this, remember those big tune boxes? Yeah. Yeah. Big silver shiny shiny yeah, shiny. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's blaring. We are the champions and we're arm to arm and we're still in our gear. This is like 45 minutes after the game and we're singing together. Finally, coach Osiki comes back in and says, guys, you got all your families out there waiting to see it. Like this is, you got to get out of the locker room here pretty soon. And we didn't, we knew this was the last time we were going to be together. We had played together since we were six years old, right? right? And this was it. This was the culmination. This was the top of the mountain. We had won that state tournament. And so we finally get our gear off. It's the last time we are ever going to be together as a team. We're all seniors, a lot of us. And you walk out. And back in those days in the Civic Center, the, the family area is right outside the locker room below the bleachers, which were kind of retractable. And I'll never forget it. I walk up, and, and my mom and dad, who are still living in the same house I grew up in in Burnsville right now, they're in their mid-'80s are standing there and they've got tears in their eyes and they were not people that showed a lot of those emotions. And it was like a lightning bolt dawn. It hit me like this wasn't just about me. You know, when you're an 18 year old kid, you always think it's all about you. Right. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh my God, this was their journey too. Like all the hours, the you know, driving to the rink at six o'clock in the morning for practice, sacrificing so many things on their end to get me the equipment that I needed, the hockey schools, all that time, the ups and downs, the, the, the journey had ended and they'd, you know, they had been there every step of the way. And it was so unbelievably emotional. Like they were just in tears and I was just like, finally, like, Oh my God, I finally got it as a dumb, you know, teenage kid. I finally figured it out. Right. Like, okay. And it just was awesome. And so when I say best and worst of times, it, it was sad because that was it for us as hockey players at Burnsville. And it was great because we had done everything we could possibly do. And it meant so much to not just us, but to our families. And it was a tight knit bunch and it was just an awesome, awesome time. Oh, I love that. You know, you talk about, um, I, I didn't play hockey. Uh, I played pond, uh, you know, oh, yeah. beefy Mahoney across the street. His yeah. name was Wayne Mahoney, but he was like six, four, like in sixth beefy? grade, beefy Mahoney. <laughs> He'd hip check me across the pond. Right. So love it. I, I played pond hockey, but I, I ne- never um, played. I was a soccer player, soccer, basketball track. But when I was interning in college and I, plus I loved hockey, I, you know, what got me into watching my mom would listen to it on the radio. 
Oh. She would listen to it on the radio, and that was my time to stay up with my mom. My dad and my brothers, I don't know hockey. My oldest brother, who's a huge hockey fan, and then when I was on air at Nesson, and I was the Bruins studio host, and all the guys, because he did drywall and construction, like, oh, you taught her everything. But he goes, she taught me. I don't know anything about hockey. I loved it. My parents bought me my first TV so I could watch the Bruins games when we all went to bed, as long as I wasn't loud. My mom said, you know, um, I would go, yes! And she, and that's one. But I loved Dave Shea doing those um, interviews in between. Like, that's what got me into broadcasting. Wow. Those interviews in between, because the guys took their helmets off, and in just a two or three minutes, he would talk about, hey, da da. And they're sweating, they're in the uniforms, but they actually went up the old Boston Garden stairs into the small yeah, little room. I remember those. And they did the, these interviews. And I said, I want, I want to do that. Um, and that's what I love. So keep that in mind. That's why I did it. So I'm interning at WBZ, and it is now, um, I forget. Who, what team they're playing, but it was Lake Superior State was in town, and it was at the Harvard Bright Arena, and that's when Lake State was really, really good. So I'm dating myself because they haven't been good for a while. Sorry, Lake Superior State. My friend Zach Trotman, I know. Awesome, awesome. But anyhow, so I'm there, and I'm standing. I'm an intern, and I'm standing in the hallway, you know, because we're waiting to go across the ice because at Harvard, you have to walk across the ice oh, to get to. Oh, I've been there. So I'm waiting there, and – and um. One of the defensemen, because he was he was like six four and six six on skates. One of the defensemen from Lake Superior State, don't even know his name. This was a minute ago, came off the bench, put his stick under my throat because I'm against the wall, right? Because you're standing in the oh, wow. And he's like, "Get you and your blanking photographer out of here." What? Now while that's happening, oh yeah, and I'm against the the, the wall, and um, Jackie Parker who was a coach of VU at the time. Legendary. Right. And he was working, you know, cause these coaches that may not be in it anymore are still working the, you know, NCAAs and stuff. And he's this, he's, if you don't know him, he's this feisty guy. Right. So he's kind of like, he walks fast. He was, and I saw him out the corner <laughs> of my eyes. He's walking down the hallway and he kind of like looked in and he did one of those and came right back and ran at that guy. And he was a fraction of the size of this hockey player. And he basically picked him up by the Jersey, put him, back on the bench and it was like i don't know what happened because i'm sure jackie parker he gave him the business to, told his kid so i was like because <sighs> okay. I, I had a little mark under my neck Jeez. i like from the stick and people are like so i get back and don shane dearly departed i loved him um former broadcaster he's a legend in detroit after he was in boston um he he went on air and called them lake inferior state because yes. of me he didn't say what had happened, but that's what happened. So my friend's like, do you still like hockey? I go, I love it more than ever. <laughs> I go, I went to BC and Jackie Parker saved me. BC, BU, are you kidding me? Does it get any better than that? <laughs> Does it get any better than that? And you that's know, awesome. you stick around long enough and you're, and you'll see it all. You see, yeah, I and, thought you were going somewhere else. I thought he was going to come over and help you across the ice. I didn't know he was going to put a stick on your throat. No, no, what a jackass. But, that's, but this is where the emotions get. Like you talk about being yeah. young and being dumb. And the emotions of a game and they were losing kind of gets to you. And, I suppose. And, um, but I still remember that. And I still call them Lake Inferior State in my mind. I won't call them that on air. They just played. You just did. But yeah. <laughs> can no. you imagine if that happened today? Yes. With social media? No, Ooh, it would never. Big, big trouble. Anyway, we digress. Well, Kevin, we could tell stories all day Yeah, long. Brandon, yes. like, what are we doing yes. here? <laughs> yeah, well, congratulations. And before we go, tell people about your new podcast, which I'm so happy to talk about. Really excited about it. It's called Wooden Sticks. It's going to kind of focus on the men and women that were players, coaches, and managers um, over the last 30 or 40 years in with ties to Minnesota. And so it started with a guy like Lou Nanny. Why, why not start at the top? And right. I've had a conversation with uh, Nate Prosser and Pat Micheletti and Rachel Ramsey. And today I just recorded one with Jimmy Jetland, who was one of my heroes as a kid, got to coach his daughter at St. Thomas. And next week, hope to have Natalie Darwitz on, who was one of the greatest hockey players from the state. Fantastic. And now the general manager in the PWHL for Minnesota. So really excited about Wooden Sticks. It's on Talk North, uh, at least one show a week, and, and just really proud of where this thing is going and uh, really enjoyed our conversation today. Well, same here. Kevin Gorg, everyone. Gorgie, you know I love you. Love you right back. Good to have you on here. Thanks so much. You got it.